Do not watch this if you haven't seen Joker, alright? I'm just gonna make that perfectly clear from the get-go. Unless you have watched Todd Phillips' Joker starring Joaquin Phoenix from beginning to end, do not watch this video because I'm gonna be talking about some spoilers here. So reactions to the Joker have been a little bit mixed from both audiences and critics, but for the most part everybody's leaning more towards the positive side. Some are calling it a masterpiece, the movie of the year, others are calling it overhyped, others are calling it offensive and liable to incite real-world violence, which, yes, we're living in 2019 and still having that conversation. If I were to give a quick half-minute review, I would say that The Joker is a very in-depth, very well-handled character piece that, while a bit overwritten and full of itself at times, still has a firm grasp on its subject matter, and manages to bring layers and humanity to one of the greatest villains in comic book history, which is no mean feat. The cinematography was outstanding, the soundtrack was haunting, Phoenix's act Acting is, of course, Oscar-worthy. All in all, Joker is a very engaging, if incredibly bleak, cinematic experience. But what stood out to me the most, having watched it a second time now, was how well Joker handles the perspective of its titular character. Character perspective means everything in a film, especially in a movie like this with such a prominent main protagonist. Now, we could spend ages defining the different types of perspective that exist in stories, such as first person, first First person limited, third person omniscient, etc, etc, as well as how well they fit into movies. But that's what they have creative writing courses for, so go take one of those if you're really curious, or just look up some quick definitions on Google. The only thing that's important for this video essay is defining the perspective of Todd Phillips' Joker. What Arthur Fleck, or as he is later called the Joker, is, is an unreliable narrator, possibly one of the best examples of it in recent popular cinema. An unreliable narrator narrator is, quite simply, a narrator whose credibility has been seriously compromised, and who can't be trusted to recount his or her story accurately. We've all seen these, Jack, or simply the narrator from Fight Club, Teddy Daniels from Shutter Island, Hart and Cole from True Detective, Trevor from The Machinist, Elliot from Mr. Robot, the list goes on and on. They can either be mentally ill, or their perspective of the events in the movie is incredibly limited, or they could just be lying to the audience for the sake of getting pity points. All that matters is, by the end of this story, we the audience know that this character's recounting of events is more than likely biased, skewed, or fabricated altogether. They are, as the name suggests, unreliable, and that is definitely the case for Arthur Fleck. The first third of the film establishes this very quickly. When Arthur is telling his boss about an attack that was done on him by a gang of kids who stole the sign that he was advertising, his boss points out to him just how absurd and ridiculous the story is. This is done deliberately in order to plant the seed of doubt in the audience's mind as to whether or not we can trust Arthur's version of the story. Did this attack happen, or was it just some fantasy that he unconsciously dreamt up so that he can continue to play the victim? Another example would be Arthur shooting the three men in the subway. This is a major event in the film, acting as a catalyst for the clown riots that we would later see, as well as Arthur's rise to fame as as the Joker. But at the same time, can you honestly say for sure whether it happened like how we saw it? Yeah, we saw Arthur shoot and kill them, but this is a man that we know suffers from delusional episodes. We saw him play out a fantasy of meeting his idol, Murray Franklin, on live TV. His mother suffers from delusions, and she's been living in her make-believe love affair with Thomas Wayne for 30 years. For all we know, Arthur could have just watched the news report of the killings the next day and what we saw in the subway was just another of his fantasies, no different than him appearing on the Murray Franklin show at the beginning. The movie does this several times in order to keep the audience on their toes. By the conclusion, we can't be sure what we saw was real and what was just in the head of our mentally ill protagonist. The most overt case of this would be the twist reveal that the girl that he's been seeing this whole time barely knew him and he was just living in another delusional fantasy that the two were going out. This is an example of 
something I wish the filmmakers had toned down a little bit, kind of like left it more to the audience's interpretation, like we had to piece it for ourselves whether they were actually together or not, but it's still handled pretty well in my opinion, so I don't really mind it all that much. It's just one of those small little nitpicks I would change. The important takeaway here is that Arthur's point of view simply cannot be trusted, which opens up a myriad of possibilities for how you could view his character. From one point of view, he's just a mentally ill man who's been neglected and mistreated by a society that he doesn't fit into, and only becomes the Joker as a result of this abuse. From another perspective, Arthur could be a latent psychopath, using the events in the film as a convoluted justification for venting his frustration out on innocent people. To someone else's perspective, he could be a financially destitute man struggling to fight against an unjust system where the wealthy control everything. And to another, he could be a self-pitying douchebag, blaming everyone else for his own inadequacies and pointing the figure at the wealthy instead of taking responsibility for his own actions. It's impossible to say which of these is right because to a certain extent, they all are. And that's what makes the film so brilliant. By having the plot be filtered through the very cracked lens of Arthur's point of view, we the audience are encouraged to draw our own conclusions. It doesn't hold our hand, it doesn't tell us what to feel about him, it doesn't glorify the Joker, it doesn't condone his actions nor say that he was in the right. All it does is force us, the viewer, to truck along with him as he falls down this deep, dark rabbit hole. And this might be the reason many viewers and critics were left cold after watching the movie. We aren't used to wearing the shoes of a person who's devolved into such a vile and heinous state. It's like being asked to share the perspective of a school shooter or a suicide bomber, someone who has become so detached from civilized society that basic human morality becomes a joke to them. And the simple fact is, is that most people aren't willing to have that level of empathy. By forcing them to share the perspective of such a broken individual, the movie is also forcing us to take a look at our society from the bottom up, and it's just not a pleasant place to be. A lot of people call Joker cynical and bleak, perhaps missing that that's the whole point. This is a story about how someone becomes the kind of monster who would kill a man live on air just because he made fun of him. This is how we get school shooters, this is how we get domestic terrorists. This story is the prelude to some of the most awful and heinous crimes still committed in the Western world. Combine mental illness with internalized narcissism, add a little bit of abusive parenthood and put the whole package in an uncaring, indifferent society and of course you're gonna get monsters like the Joker. That's not cynicism, that's reality. What I respect most about the film is that it isn't outright forcing any particular message or agenda on us. We are seeing this plot from Arthur's unreliable perspective, sure, but it doesn't pussyfoot around the immorality of his actions. He is still a monster by the end, and the movie frames him as such. For example, let's talk about that rant that he gives near the end where he's on the Murray Franklin show. One major thing that he said was, what happens when you cross a mentally ill man with an indifferent society that treats him like trash? You get what you fucking deserve. Being honest, this kind of bugged me a bit when I saw it the first time. It just seemed like the writer or the director was beating us over the head with his point. Like, do you get it? Do you get it? Society made him this way. Society made him this way. But the more I thought about it, the more I considered it less the director trying to force this point and more the Joker himself. This is his way of justifying to himself what he has done. He doesn't have to face responsibility and own up for the people that he has killed. It's all society's fault. So how can he possibly be blamed? That's another thing a lot of criminals do to moralize their actions. They point the finger at society or their own parents or some guy who made fun of them and think that that excuses everything that they've done. But while this is escapist and ultimately highlights the Joker's self-delusional narcissism, he isn't entirely wrong either, and to me, that's the whole point. Arthur is responsible for the crimes he commits and the monster he eventually becomes, but at the same time, so is his abusive and mentally unbalanced mother. So is the media who just see him as a prop to either laugh at or condemn as an inciter of violence. So are the wealthy elite who see him and those like him as disposable scum. So are the average working citizens too engulfed in their own lives to listen to or even care about his problems. So are the faceless rioters hailing the act of his clownish persona as heroic, thereby validating his violent and psychopathic tendencies. No 
one person or even group of people is guilty of creating men like the Joker. Whether by action or inaction, we all share the blame. We are all guilty. By showing this series of events through the eyes of such a flawed, unreliable, mentally unbalanced and emotionally broken narrator, we can both attach and detach ourselves from his point of view. It's like reading an Edgar Allan Poe book. We feel bad for the guy, sure, but that doesn't make what he does any less terrible. A lot of Joker's critics have argued that the film glorifies incel culture, that it tries to create sympathy for violent white criminals, but I would argue that that mindset totally disregards the difference between sympathy and pity. Sympathy implies that we, the audience, understand and relate to Arthur's mindset. That we're like, yeah, you go, Joker. Go ahead and kill innocent people who just made fun of you. Society treated you like shit. You've earned it, man. But that's not what the film is trying to say, at least not to me. We aren't meant to sympathize with the Joker. We're meant to pity him, to see the terrible road that he's traveled up to this point and feel horrified by it. If if the film has any message, it's not feel bad for the violent psychopath, it's simply don't ignore the warning signs. Listen to a person's cry for help. Don't give the mentally unbalanced man a gun. Don't cut off support to those who need it the most, otherwise you risk creating men like this over and over again. We live in a world where the vulnerable and mentally ill are shunned and left to fend for themselves, to fester in their own hate and resentment of the society which abandoned them until they just can't hold it in anymore. How can you expect to help people like that before they go and kill a guy on live TV or some other heinous crime unless you understand their viewpoint first? And is there a better way of understanding anybody's viewpoint than walking a mile in their shoes? I can't think so, and really that's the power of perspective for you. It really can change minds as long as you are willing to listen.